Uh, we've been going over hell. Um, <clears throat> we started, the very first class was eternity, life after death. What is it all about? And then we talked about hell in the Old Testament. I'm just going to recap. We talked about Sheol in the Old Testament. Everybody goes, dogs, animals, <laughs> pets, lizards, people. Everybody goes to Sheol. And then when we get to the New Testament, this character named Jesus steps in, and he actually starts talking about Gehenna. And he starts talking about Hades. And we learn that there was, there was a development on hell, and it actually gets pretty crazy. Not only does it turn into a place where people go after they die, but it actually turns into a place where there's fire, where there's torment, where there's weeping, where there's darkness and where people actually go. Um, so, what we're doing today is, over the, over the last two weeks and up till today, we've been looking at the different views of hell. And we've, I'm, I think these are probably the most popular, there are eight, eight different views on hell. And we already went over a few. And you know, for many of us, we probably think, well, there's only one view of hell. But actually, there's even other Christians who have different views. There's other denominations. And we're, we're going to talk about that. And uh, at the end of the class, we'll just have some just time to think about it. But today, we're going to finish up with the definitions on hell. Uh, so, but first, before we do that, let's talk about what we already looked at. Um, we already looked at... We already looked at eternal conscious torment, right? And Josiah gave that class. Josiah, you want to give us a brief uh, summary of yours? That you go to hell, and everybody, or anyone who is not saved goes to hell. And what is hell according to this eternal? eternal it's eternal, eternal, yeah. Torment and punishment. Torment of your soul. Punishment. Alright, who's believed this up until at least now? One person? What do you what do you think, sir? You don't have to tell us now, but who's believed that? Yeah. What do you as have you grown up have have you grown up believing that hell is an eternal place of torment? Yeah. You have grown up that way. Yeah. Alright. Um, Steve, what do you what do you grow up believing? Yeah. That okay. I think for the most of part, most of us have. All right. So what we're going to challenge is: is that really true or not? Because some people would say it isn't. All right. But we're going to decide for ourselves. All right. So that's what eternal. And then we went over reincarnation, which was Eileen. Anybody remember that one? What re? Is an animal or something. So there's no hell, or there hell is maybe something very few, or if anyone goes to, because. You get reincarnation is that when you die, you come back as something else, depending on how you've lived. Good or bad depends on what you come back as. And you're always reincarnated. You come back as a squirrel, you come back as an ant, come back as a cook, you know, whatever. A king, depending on how you've lived your life. Uh, and that was reincarnation. And the goal is to get to nirvana, which very few have reached, according to even... Uh, Buddhists, you know, they said Jesus was the first one. I believe some of the branches say that. And then Buddha, but uh, reincarnation, all right? So that's a view. Hell can't exist because we're reincarnated, or very few ever even go. Um, we're going to talk about purgatory. We talked about universalism. That was Steve. Do you want to give us a summary, Steve, on universalism? Uh, universalism is like everyone believes that everyone goes to heaven without any punishment. Everybody goes to heaven. All right. So universalism is the is that the whole universe is going to be reconciled to God. That sin has definitely destroyed things, but God has planned it out to bring it all back together. It's like His family spread out. You know, everybody's all messed up, but the plan is I'm going to get everybody back. Everybody's going to get saved, no matter what religion you are. No matter what you've done, no matter Buddhist, Muslim, whatever, Christian, everybody's going to go to heaven because he's going to do it at the end. That's the belief of universalism, all right, that ultimately everybody's going to make it. Um, and there's a verse in Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Uh, 
popular thanatology. That's what Kimberly went over. And uh, that was, you want to give us a little recap on that? It's just when people die, but they come back. All right. To when, life. So, I mean, that was basically the whole thing about it. They die and come back to life? Yeah. Well, and the, well, it's, it's the study of what happens while yes. they were dead. Yes. All right. And there, you know, they have different, there's been different opinions. People have said different things. Like, have you said, seen the movie 30 Minutes in Hell or stuff like that? Anybody? Hula, you seen any of those? I read the book. You read the book? Wow. All right. So, you know, there's different, people study that. There are people who've gone, who've died and come back, they study it. What'd you see? What, what happened? And that's what this is, thanatology. So the view is that maybe there isn't a hell, uh, or maybe it's different. And they build their case off what people have seen. All right, so today we got, let's see, one, two, three, four. And three people are out. So I'm going to pick up the slack, um, and we're going to take it from there. When do you want to go, Elmer? It's just me and you, so you decide. You could do it from your seat, bro. I'm not even, at this point, I'm happy if you even just say it. All right, so I'm going to start. Deciding? Okay, let's do it. So we're going to start with purgatory, and he's going to define it for us. I don't have my phone. Oh, that's right. You want to come get it? Go ahead. we got to put it back after. Huh? It's going to be a distraction. <laughs> no, just, it's all right. <laughs> just do it from right here, then you can put it back when you're done. Okay. All right, so Elmer's going to present on purgatory. What is it? A place or state of suffering inhabited by the souls of sinners who are ex expiating their sins before going to heaven. All right, read that one more time, please. A place or state of suffering inhabited by the souls of sinners who are expiating their sins before going to heaven. Okay, so let's just break down that definition. So purgatory is a place. A place. A okay. State or state of place or state of what? Sinners. Of suffering. Of suffering. Okay. Suffering. What else did it say? Um, inhabited by the souls of sinners. Souls. Okay. So the souls of sinners go there. All right. What else? Just read expediting. in. Re, read in. Expediting. Ex, expediting? Yeah. Or, expediting. Is that what it says? Expediting. 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 Yeah. Oh, it's this word. Yeah, it's not. I don't think he, it is. He doesn't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Sorry, John. Expiating, okay. <laughs> Same thing. Okay, expiating. That's like paying for your sins. Thank you. Uh, okay, wait. Uh, did you turn it on? Okay. Uh, all right. So, experience. So you're paying for your sins. All right. So, who believes in purgatory? Anybody? What branch of Christianity? Catholicism. Anybody disagree? Any other branches believe in purgatory? Elmer? Anybody else? No, I don't know. Okay. So, big branch of Christianity believes in purgatory. What is it? All right. So, it's a place of suffering for the souls of sinners. Um, I was going to show you a video on it, probably be easier, but this is what uh, this is what it's actually said in the catechisms. It says, all who die in God's grace but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their internal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Everybody catch that? No. Alright, I'm going to read it one more time. You guys tell me, break it down in your own words. All who die in God's grace, okay, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification, so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. 
All right, so what did they just say? This is the catechisms in the... So it's for the people that are saved, but yet are imperfect. Right, right. Okay, so purgatory is the belief that for people who are saved, they go there because they aren't totally purified. They, they undergo purification so they, they can achieve the holiness necessary to enter heaven. Okay, so... After death, they go into this place called purgatory, and they're there getting purified. They're you know, getting rid of all the filth before you can go to heaven. So when, when does the money come involved? Right. Well, that was, that was a long time ago. That was in the Martin Luther era. Uh, I, I don't remember if that was 1500s, 1700s. But it was believed that you could purchase people out of purgatory. That by paying indulgences is what it was called. At one time, the Catholic Church did have this, that you could pay to get people out of purgatory. And uh, that's what got everything all riled up. So, but according to the, right now, the catechisms of the Catholic Church, that people who are Christians go into purgatory to get purified. All right? And do you think they have, there are any biblical basis to believe this? Yeah. Jesse, you don't think so? Anybody? First Peter three nineteen. Oh, <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> All right. So what's crazy is there's this book called the Maccabees. Anybody ever heard of it? Heard of it? All right. I want to show you something. This is the Catholic Bible, and there's a book in here called. Just find it. My grandma's Catholic, by the way, so I'm not. I'm not dissing on anybody. I'm just going to show you this. <laughs> One Maccabees. There we go. 652. Yeah, just because she's my grandma. No. I, yeah, anyways, that's all another subject. But. All right, so the book of Maccabees. We don't have this in the Protestant Bible. But in here, there's a story about... Um, Something happened, I, I, I didn't brush up on it, but something happened, and these people were praying for people who had died. I can't remember if there was a war, I, I didn't brush up on it, but there was a, there's, a, there's a story, and there were, they prayed for the people who have already died. And so they took that, and they said, okay, there's got to be, if this is really the scripture of God, which it is believed so, that's why it's in the Bible, that you should be praying for people who have already died. Why? And they use a few verses. One is in 1 Peter 3.19, and one is in 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians 3 says that everyone... Well, you know what? Let's just read it. 1 Corinthians 3. First Corinthians 3. I have Bibles up here already want so Kim has them, actually. 11 to 15. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder would, will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. All right? So what they've taken, what done with this verse is said that, the, that people have to be purified before getting to heaven. That's kind of how it all breaks down is that it's, it's believed that people were still, even though we've been totally cleansed from our sins. Jesus paid the price. We still have this sin in us. So purgatory is there to get rid of it all. It's this refining process. But it will be, but we'll be saved like someone barely escaping through the flames. But I listened to an actual a priest give a little on YouTube talk about this. And he was, he, he made it seem really awesome. And uh, what his thing was saying is he was saying it was, very, it was so beautiful to have purgatory because it's God's grace allowing us sinners to still be purified, bless you, to, 
to be uh, purified, to go into his presence, and he gives us the opportunity to be purified to get in. But, you know, you guys, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. You guys have to make your decision. This is what, this is part of the Catholic doctrine. You, it's like you have to believe this almost, that purgatory is there. So, does it really matter? Is it really that big of a deal? What, you know, if you're getting purified before you go or any, I mean, is it something we need to fight and kill each other about? I don't know. Ooh. Like I, as long as I get to heaven, whatever, you know. But but anyways, I, per, on a personal opinion on this, um, I think a lot of it's built off the book of Maccabees. And we, at, at least the Protestant Christianity, don't use that book as authoritative God's word because of some other, you know, issues, when it was written, who wrote it, stuff like that. Um, and, I, I, and it seems like this verse is taken out of context, uh, but it follows what the Maccabees say. So, purgatory is an option for you guys. If, you wanted, if you're looking for alternatives to hell, purgatory is a place to where the saved, okay? So you're already saved, but you have to go here to get refined. So I don't know what you believed in the past about purgatory, but just clear it up is that it's not a place to where sinners go and get... Um, I mean, not sinners, but people who are unsaved go. It's people where the saved go, and they get purified. So it's this refining with fire. So I don't know if they're getting burned or whatever. Yes, sir. I heard that babies go there. Maybe. Yeah, if they're not, if they haven't accepted Christ, or well, they get baptized as a baby. I don't know. So it, it, in the Catholic belief, it's the babies go there. I think everybody. Well, I don't know about everybody, but. People who are going to heaven. I think everybody, because everybody sins, and everybody's not perfect. But some people stay longer than others. The big issue with this purgatory is that what Christ did for you on the cross isn't enough. That's the big deal, is that you aren't really pure. Um, you need a second purification. And that's where the issue comes in with, with, with us, is that you... You tell me there's got we got there's other things we have to do to be fully saved. All right, so that's purgatory. All right, what, and whether you believe that or not, um, you know we can talk about that. We have three more. Alternate world. How the heck does that make sense? Alternate world, and let, let me read this to you. Actually, this is in the. All right, alternate world. Another suggestion concerning the state, both the saved and the unsaved dead, is that they lived in another world and are able to relate to individuals both in that world and this. The view is the basis of the occult practice of communicating with disincarnate spirits, which is condemned and forbidden in Scripture. All right, so an alternate view of hell is that there is alternate worlds. And is there anywhere in Scripture where somebody calls back somebody from the dead and talks with their spirit? Yes. Where? Elijah. Elijah? Where? Abigail was the king. It was the king. Solomon. Was the king Solomon? Anybody else? No. Close. Close, not as close. Can you think of any? Call the spirit out of the dead. Talk to him. But somebody that got abandoned by Christ, uh, by God, and Saul. He, Solomon. Saul. 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 Yeah. Okay. So King Saul was distressed, and he wanted to talk to the prophet Samuel to get some advice about God. You know, what do I do? So he went to this, um, oh, Psychic. yeah, pretty much, uh, I forget what they call him now, huh, yeah, just went blank there, all right, but like a psychic, or a, uh, wow, yeah, 
Yeah, so it's, you know, calling up spirits, talking to the dead, psychic. Um, and he went there and said, I need you to bring up Samuel because I need to talk to him. And she brings up what seems to be Samuel. And because they're conversating and he, you know, the person speaking knows everything. So it seems like she really brought up Samuel. And uh, whether it was really him or not is debated, but it seems like Samuel came back. So what the belief is in this alternate world is that once you die here, there's other worlds where the spirits live. And you don't actually go to hell, you go to another world, and your spirit lives. But there's communication between those and this, built off the belief, you know, because you, people actually do this. Psychics actually speak to spirits and stuff like that. They actually, it actually do it. Whether they're the, those are the spirits or whether they're just demons manipulating and tricking well, is the question. You can definitely tell what Samuel told Saul. Yeah. It had to be him. Yeah, I know. It sounded like it. Absolutely. Because he recommended him for doing that. Yeah. The, in the Bible, God forbids it, condemns it for trying to do that. And, the, you know, the, I guess that's a whole other study of whether that's even possible, you know, stuff like that, to call up the dead. People do it now. You know, you get into these occult the demon things and they're calling up the dead and stuff, and, and it's demonic. There's demons involved in this kind of stuff. And God's telling us, hey, don't do that. So why would he say that? You know, just so we don't... So we don't know what we should know, what we want to know. I mean, that's was the issue with Adam and Eve. Say, don't eat the apple because it's going to kill you. Maybe he's saying the same thing. Don't call it dead because they're lying to you. Or I don't know. But uh, that's all. That's the other view of hell. That actually, there's alternate worlds. That there's another world you go to. Uh, and we have two left. Humanism. Humanism. What is humanism? Let's see what time. Humanism is the belief. Humanism is the belief that God, there's no way God could send anybody to hell. There's no way. That don't make sense to us. And I've I've had that with me too. I think, man, God, would you really do that? My gosh, that's pretty bad. And and for us, it's it's us as humans to with our own thinking and our own um, it's almost like almost atheism to think that there's no way God could do that to somebody. And if, if this God is supposed to be a loving God, how could he send somebody to hell? Um, all right, so in a nutshell, that's what humanism is. Is this 1 John 4 8? Is that God is love? All right, Jesus is a nice guy, he is not going to hurt you. He wouldn't condemn you for your sins. He might spank you and then, bad boy, come on into heaven. But he wouldn't send you to hell. All right. So that's kind of the view on humanism is God. God's not that cruel. Um, which is which is a big one for us today with atheism. Uh, you know, we of course don't believe in God, but even if there was a God, he wouldn't do that. And there's a hard time reconciling this with God. So you're going to encounter a lot of this. And the last one, annihilation. You guys have any questions up until now before we hit the last one? All right, annihilation. This is the last view on hell. We went through all of them. And this is the last one. Anybody think they know what annihilation is? You just die. All right. No hell. Well, actually, there is a hell. But it's not eternal torment. Once you get in, you're dead. You're annihilated. You're destroyed forever. Anybody else have any thoughts on it? Uh, is there any biblical basis for believing this? Do you think there's any verses that might support this? It's actually a lot. A lot, lot one of ones that make you think. Um, I put this one in there for now, 1 John 4, 8. Uh, God is love. You know, he, could, he couldn't do that. But is there any branches of, let's not say Christianity, let's say monotheism, one God. Is there any branches that believe in annihilation that you know of? 
the JWs. Jehovah's Witness. Okay? They're leaving the highlight. Here's, what, uh, here's something that they said. Some Bible translations use the word hell for Hebrew word Sheol, matching the Greek word Hades, both, both of which refer to the common grave of mankind. Many people believe in a fiery hell as shown in the religious artwork accompanying this article. However, the Bible teaches otherwise. Here's four points to give. Those in hell are unconscious, cannot feel pain. Good people go to hell. Death, not torment in a fiery hell, is the penalty for sin. And the verse is, he who has died has been acquitted from his sin. Eternal hell would violate God's justice. When the first man Adam sinned, God told him that his punishment would simply be to pass out of existence. Dust you are, and dust you will return. God would have been lying if he were actually sending Adam to a fiery hell. And Actually, there's one more. God, God does not even contemplate eternal torment. The idea that he would punish people in hellfire is contrary to the Bible's teaching that God is love. Alright, yeah. that's... Who wrote the article? Jehovah's Witness. It's uh, it's on their website. That's that's what the Jehovah's Witness belief is. Is that actually people are annihilated. You don't burn in hell for eternity, and there's reasons why. All right. So after all these studyings and after all this thinking, which you only have a few minutes left, um, which one are you guys leaning towards? We read it. We at one, at one twice. We looked at a ton of verses um, for all the definition where hell is in the entire Bible, and we looked at all these definitions. Right now, which one are you guys leaning towards out of all these? Elmer, still don't know, huh? Number one. Number one. Annihilation. All right. Number one, what do you think? Number one. Alright. Which one do you want all your friends who don't know God to go to? Universal? Universalism. You're leaning towards universalism? No. Oh. I, I, number one, but you, you ask a question. You would want your friends, alright? If you could choose family members, friends, co-workers, People you don't know yet. Huh? Annihilation. Annihilation. <laughs> if you, let's say you are the judge, you get to decide the punishment. Annihilation. <laughs> yeah. But what does the Bible say? What does it lean towards? And I think that's where we have to we have to come to grips with is that there's certainly there's a way we would deal with things. Uh, Josiah and I were listening to this pastor give a explanation on hell, and he said uh, he was talking to people who had gotten raped, who had gotten their families murdered in Africa. People came in and just killed people, and uh, and they were asking about hell. And uh, he explained it to them this way. He said, imagine somebody came in and killed my daughters, raped them, cut them up, burned them, whatever, you know, just totally beat them. And he said, imagine what I would do as their punishment, what my punishment for them would be. He said, I would torture them for as long as they could live. And then I'd get the best doctors to come in, bring them back to life, full health, do it again, bring them back, I'd keep torturing them forever, and then I would ask God to give me a thousand lifetimes to do it over and over and over again. And he said, after a hundred thousand years of doing this, I'd probably say, you know what, I'll give you mercy. Don't ever do that again or else. That's, he said, if, if that was him, that's what he would do. But what the Bible teaches is that we're, what, what it looks like is teaching is that it mentions every time we hear Gehenna, every time we hear fire, there's this eternal fire, eternal torment, night and day, never ending. And what, what is difficult for us is to think that how could God do this forever and ever 
and ever, forever. You know, for us, we would say, God, the just punishment is annihilate them. Just kill them. We're done. Why would God do an eternity of punishment? And is that really what the Bible teaches? So, the goal for next week, not next week, in two weeks, because next week we're breaking up, we're doing something totally different is we're going we're gonna to actually answer this question. If God is good, why would He send people to burn in hell for eternity? And I'm hoping to answer it in a way that to where you guys, that we can answer it in a way to where you guys will actually have a good response. Because there's a lot of things we don't know, I think we're missing about God, and there's a lot of things we're missing about hell. But I think the, the just for you guys to take away today is that Really think about whether you actually believe in hell or not. Because I think, even for me, I've been thinking about this, and I heard another pastor preach of this. If I really believed in hell, how would my life change? You know, if I really believed it, I would probably do something about it. If I really believed that there was a hell, if I really believed people were going, if I really believe what the Bible teaches is that there's only one way to heaven, if there's only one way to eternity, and that's Jesus alone, and everybody else is going to hell, you know, how would it change the way I live? And I think that's something we should think about this week, is that for you personally, and then the way you react with other people, and I'll leave you with this last thing, there was this guy in, uh, I just heard it this morning, there was this guy in, um, I think it was England, and he was this really, really uh, terrible murderer. Killed a lot of people. And he was on death row. And as you know, that uh, they used to have chaplains come in. I don't know if they still do now. They'd have a chaplain come in and talk to, talk to the guy before he goes on death row. And he explained to him, there's a heaven, there's a hell. You know, if you want to give your life to God right now. And the guy who was on death row, who was about to go, he said, do you really believe this? He told the chaplain, the chaplain well, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, do you really? Because... Uh, it doesn't sound like you really believe this. And the guy was stuttering. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's what the Bible says, I think. So he says, because if I believed this, if I really believed hell was real, I, if, if the whole city of England was covered in broken glass, you know, a certain amount of feet high, if the whole city was covered in glass, and everybody in there was going to hell, I'd crawl on hands and knees to get at least one person out of there, if this was really true, if this eternal torment, fiery hell forever and ever was really true, that's the length I would go to to get somebody not to go there. And it was this guy who wasn't even a Christian, he was just, he was on his way to die. And he says, if what I'm going to is what you're describing, I would do anything I could to get, I would, to rescue anyone from going there. And I thought that was just crazy. So, I, you know, another pastor mentioned the story. I thought, man, that's, that's... But I think for us to just think about that, you know, if hell's really true, what, what should it do? How would it change us in the way we live? My gosh, it's probably the most important thing. Um, besides etern you know, eternal life with God. You know, there's only two options. So, uh, we're going to finish this up next week. We're going to split up guys and girls, but we're going to finish this up um, the one after. It might take one or two just to answer any questions that rise after that, but that's the goal. So, let's, uh, let's finish this uh, for today.